let's be specific. Let's talk about China. As things stand right now, the Chinese are saying, look, we will make commitments to seriously, significantly reduce our, our carbon intensity as measured against GDP. We will do that, but we are not prepared to make binding commitments. And we're not necessarily prepared to have the international community come in and verify and monitor every single thing we do. Now, the Americans say, Unless the Chinese move on that, they're not going to move on a whole raft of other things that we'll talk about but, in a minute. You know, uh, this, this madness goes on. Um, I don't disagree with it at all, um, the Americans and the Chinese. So are you bitterly disappointed, say, uh, with the Chinese? Well, I'm, I'm very disappointed both with the Americans and the Chinese um, for um, so irrelevantly talking about this issue as if it's, it's arms control or trade negotiations. You cannot cut a deal with Mother Nature. You cannot uh, uh, have a negotiation with planetary boundaries they are fixed so we all have to understand that we have to live within these boundaries and I, I do I do actually believe that the Chinese government and the Chinese people will come around to these thinking and these ideas and I, I see a lot of improvement a lot of progress on 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 China and and in India in, in South Africa um, uh, in Brazil uh, uh, since the Copenhagen Accord I just wonder whether over the last year, you've looked back at the way this whole climate debate has developed and you've perhaps thought to yourself, it has been a mistake for developing countries to just form one block and in some ways to be driven by the bigger and very powerful emerging economies, thinking of China, India, Brazil. Because I saw, indeed I saw it when I was talking to you in Copenhagen that year ago, that there was a huge influence being wielded by Beijing in particular, and Beijing's interest is fundamentally different from that of the poorer developing countries. Uh, I, uh, this is why we want to talk about big emitting countries and not necessarily developing countries and developed countries. Yes, there is an issue on that, but um, more and more we are seeing that a number of developing countries are coming to understand that for instance, G77 doesn't necessarily look after our interests in these specific issues. Do you feel that now? That uh, well, the G77, uh, which is this big block of poorer and emerging countries, it doesn't work it doesn't in terms work. of representing it, your interests? In, in terms of representing our interest in the climate change debate, I don't think that they they do represent us and they are uh, working in our interests. So we don't need to be uh, grouped and banded together in this way. I keep saying that this is uh, uh, an archic pre-war uh, uh, pre uh, institution, organization that, uh, that has become obsolete and it's not really quite relevant right now. This is what one of the senior US climate envoys, Todd Stern, said the other day. He said, you cannot build a system premised on the notion that China should be treated the same as Chad, for example, when China is now the world's largest emitter. And as a matter of political reality, we'd get no support within the United States, especially in Congress, for a climate agreement that required action of us, but not from China. Sounds to me on that particular uh, point you have now decided to align yourself with the United States. But we haven't decided to align ourselves with anyone but we've decided to keep our stance in the middle saying that this is not a rich country poor country debate. This is a debate for everyone and if we can all get together and find a solution to this this is the only way that we can move forward. If. Well, uh, Actually, I, I, if's a very important I, I, word it, here. It is a very important word but I, what, what we are sensing and what we are seeing now is that it is moving Moving along these lines. The United States really needs to do a lot more, uh, perhaps a bit more than China, and, and we now seem to be bogged down in mentioning China all the time. But it's not just China, it's the United States as well. It's only Europe who is able to come up with a proper framework on this, and no one else is doing it. So uh, I think. But as Todd Stern's words alluded to, there is a political reality in the United States. You may not like it, he may not like it, but there is a reality with the Republicans now uh, controlling the House, stronger in the Senate, which means that the sorts of actions Barack Obama wanted to take to make America central mm -hmm. to the climate change project are now not going to be taken. Well, uh, I understand that they are finding alternative paths uh, to um, the Congress and the Senate to see how they may be able to come up with other legislations as well. But then again, we all have parliaments and congresses but leadership is when you go out and lead not when you follow the pack so I hope that there will be leadership in the United States in China in India and elsewhere 
Um, I believe that it is possible to lead and I believe that the people of the United States will listen to this. Yes, of course, we need to have grassroots action in the United States. People need to take this whole thing to the streets and let everyone know that here is a serious issue. Here is a serious issue, you say. Again, pressing you personally, do you believe you made a mistake when in terms of publicizing this serious issue, you made a great play last year for demanding that actions be taken to reduce the carbon emissions of this world of ours to a point where the overall CO2 levels in the atmosphere would be 350 parts per million. You went around the world chanting 350, 350. It is now is it not clear that it is totally unrealistic? And are you prepared to drop that particular demand? No, I'm demand? not prepared to pr drop that demand. We can't collectively uh, opt out for suicide. We can't do that. If we opt out 350 parts per million, if we give up on 1.5 degrees, we won't be around. You talked not so very long ago, soon after taking power, of coming up with a plan to relocate the entire population of the Maldives, if necessary. You looked at uh, possible land purchase in Australia, in India, maybe even Sri Lanka. Where does that stand now? Well, adaptation and evacuation, of course, is the bottom line. Evacuation, dry land is the bottom line. And we have to be all braced. We have to save for a rainy day. We have to understand that this situation can arise and therefore we have to be ready for that. I do not disagree with that. But that doesn't mean that we have to relent on 350. We will not relent on no, 350. No, well, I, I hear and that I, message loud and, and clear, and, but and I'm, I'm, I'm rather more concerned at the moment about the fact that your plan to develop a sovereign wealth fund mm -hmm. to actually fund the purchase of a, an emergency escape route seems to have completely collapsed.